we go. There's the mic kicking itself in. Uh, my name is Jesse. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from around the world today. And welcome to another exciting adventure with us at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Now, we've got a lot of familiar faces in the crowd today, but I know we've got some people who haven't joined in a while. We've got some newbies joining on YouTube. If you are new to us, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And this is a particularly special month for us because February is classically always since we were founded back in 2015, our entire month dedicated to amazing women in science, engineering, technology, and math. I really encourage you to check out our YouTube channel for some incredible stories to come over the next few weeks. We've got whales, we've got conservationists, we had an astronaut a few days ago, just incredible women from around the globe, and a really special opportunity to showcase their story. So thank you all so much for joining us in this special, special month. Now today, we are joined by one of my very favorite educators in the world. I've had the chance to work with some educators for like five plus years now. Daphne is among them. She is joining us from OceanWise in Vancouver, BC. She's going to talk to us today about my favorite topic in the world, which is the deep sea, the largest, most mysterious ecosystem on this planet where we are constantly finding new species. It's a really exciting journey we're going to take together. And before I bring her in, because I forgot to mention it, we're going to have a Kahoot today. So if you're joining us on YouTube, if you're joining us on StreamYard, if you want to go to Kahoot.it, put in this game pin. We'd love to have you take part between the talk and Q&A today. We're going to have four quick questions, have a little bit of fun between the two. Now, without further ado, I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to turn it over to Daphne to blow all your minds. Daphne, welcome in, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me today, Jesse. I'm super excited to join all of you today, especially with the amazing amount of folks joining us. Um, but as Jesse said, I am joining you from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, and I am part of OceanWise. So I am an educator with OceanWise. And if you are unfamiliar with us, uh, we are a conservation organization who has a vision in which the world's uh, ocean is healthy and flourishing. So for a quick second, close your eyes and imagine what you think a healthy and flourishing ocean would look like. Amazing. Maybe you thought you saw some fish. Maybe you're thinking of the deep sea today and you're seeing some crazy different creatures. Maybe you saw lots of whales. There's so much life in the ocean. And I want us to explore it all today. But before we dive in, I'd love to acknowledge that I am joining you from Vancouver, Canada. And that's on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil First Peoples. And I'm really grateful that I'm able to join you from their lands today. But I also want us to remember and respect the land, water, and sky around us as they have since time immemorial. So as we go through the program today, just think about ways that you can better respect all of the nature around you, even the other people around you. But we at OceanWise, we love to explore the ocean. Give me a thumbs up if you love exploring the ocean as well and learning new things. There's so much for us always to learn. We at OceanWise, we like to focus on just a few things that we see challenging the ocean to be healthy. And some of those things that we're focusing on are challenges like climate change, ocean pollution, and overfishing. But part of all of that is learning more and educating others so we can all learn how to take action to protect the ocean. And that's what we at OceanWise are all about. So give me another thumbs up if you want to help the ocean like OceanWise. All the thumbs, Daphne. All the thumbs are up. <laughs> I love it. Well, I have a bit of a fun video to get us started here, but I did want to say that a lot of the videos and images we'll see today are from uh, NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration in the United States, as well as Nautilus Live, uh, one of a program that's associated with them as well. So if you want to learn more about the deep sea after the program, I would love for you to check them out online. But with further ado... Here we go. Can you guess what deep sea animal this might be, my friends? Oh, 
Hmm, weird squishy ball. If you guys want to share in the chat, by the way, we'd love to hear from you at any point for any of these queries or videos or anything else. Squishy Dumbo Octopus. <laughs> yeah, so if you take a look here, you might see that Squishy Dumbo Octopus looks almost like jello. It's kind of wiggling in all that water. And that is actually an adaptation or something that helps this animal survive in its home, in its habitat. And we're going to explore a bunch of the adaptations and the special uh, parts of these animals that help them survive in this deep sea. But I have one more bit to get us started here. Let's see, how many animals do you see? So there are quite a few animals that we're going to see in the deep sea. I love this video because it gives us a little window into the diversity, the different types of animals that we might explore today. So we have things like an octopus, lots of different fish, a jellyfish, lots of animals to explore. But I have, I know we're going to have Kahoot in a bit, but I have a few trivia questions to get us started today. Lots of trivia. So you all should know the drill by now. Let's see, these are me true or false. So if you're in a classroom, show thumbs up for true, thumbs down for false, or you can let us know in the chat. First question is, around 75% of the ocean has been explored. True or false? Well, give us about five to 10 seconds. Oh, we got, we have a lot of thumbs started out up and then are going down and all the chat is false, false, false. Everyone's saying false, not even been close. No, they think you're crazy. Well, you are all correct. And that is because we have not explored that much of the ocean. Less than 20% of the whole ocean has been explored. We know more about certain parts of space than we do about the ocean right here on Earth. That means there's lots of opportunities for folks to learn more and probably lots of careers if anyone thinks they might want to explore the ocean when they're older. Next question here is, the ocean is deeper than Mount Everest, the tallest mountain on earth is tall. <laughs> no way, it sounds ridiculous. By the way, the, there's one class, Miss Hill's class, there's like every student's coming right up to the camera just putting their thumbs right in the camera, which is amazing. So a lot of yeses for this. A lot of people think the ocean's deeper. That's our, our universal so far, true. The answer is true, you are correct. Mm. and. We can see here that if we were to flip Mount Everest and put it in the ocean, we would have spaces deeper than it is tall. So in a bit, we'll go through some of these layers that we see in the ocean or the kind of levels we'll see. But I have another question for you. The deep sea is the largest habitat on the planet. So think of all those different ecosystems that we might have learned about. Is it the largest? Deserts, forests, grasslands, deep ocean. I don't know. I don't know. A uh, hint to this might come up in our Kahoot as well. I don't know. Whoa. Heads up. <laughs> That's the thought. <laughs> what do we think? All trues. Aaron saying true. You're you're selling them on it very well, Daphne. <laughs> awesome. Well, you know what? You are correct. It is a huge area of the planet. You can see here from this map. Uh, this is going to show us the uh, kind of elevation or depth of areas on the planet. So if we look at the ocean, we'll see lots of blues and purples. But really, the only shallow areas of the ocean are going to be the really light blues that you see really close to shore in most areas. A lot of the ocean is very deep, like those dark blues and purples. So there's a lot to explore out there. And I think that's pretty darn cool. All right, Jesse, have we had any questions in the chat just yet? We have not. We, you, you've just been blowing their minds so much that there's been no questions. And so I'm totally cool to keep going on. We'll take all those questions at the end from our friends today. Well, perfect, because I have a question for everyone else. And that is, if we were animals or life, 
that was trying to survive in the deep sea, what would some challenges be to surviving there? Hmm, what do we think? YouTubers, feel free to chime in as well in the chat there. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, so many, you guys are like the most responsive StreamYard chat people ever, and I love it. Air and pressure, so lack of oxygen, Madam Stephanie sort of elaborated. Predators, there's things that are going to eat you in the deep sea, so you can't breathe. There's too much pressure, and you're going to be eaten. This sounds like a very dangerous place. These are some, these are some good options so far. I like, you guys are on the ball today. Nicely done. Is there anything else? Darkness and cold temperatures, really dark. I think they're hitting it all. This is amazing. <laughs> this is great. That's a great uh, variation in different challenges. And yes, those are all going to be challenges we'll find in the deep sea. Now, us as humans, we're definitely not going to survive down there. That is not what we have been. That's not the area that we live. And that's not what we've adapted to survive in. But we're going to meet some animals today that that is where they live. So I have another question for you. How do plants and algae and some other life on the planet, how do they get energy? What do we think? Mm. Take a quick guess if there is one. <laughs> My mind goes straight to like the outliers, like Venus fly trap, just eating flies. <laughs> the sun, the sun, the waves, light. Um, <laughs> sun galore. Uh, so there, there's our answer. People are are keen on. They know. They know what's going on. You know I love it. Well, you're right. It's not all plant. Not all plants are going to just get energy from the sun. Some might get their energy from other places. But the sun is going to be energy for much a lot of life on Earth. And if we are to go explore the deep sea in, say, a remote operated vehicle or ROV, we would actually be able to explore what these animals are going to get for energy once that sun isn't an option. So you can see here, we have uh, the sun that's going to be giving energy to a lot of the life on the planet like kelp, but there's also a lot of little creatures and life in the ocean, such as these little folks, the plankton. And some plankton, the phytoplankton, or the algae plankton are going to be using that sun for energy, but they're only going to survive in that sunlight zone where they're getting that sun for energy. Lots of animals that we're familiar with live here, but if we want to keep diving down deeper into the ocean, that, that plankton is going to change. The types of animals we're going to see are going to change and it's going to start getting darker and darker. Now that sun isn't a source of energy, we're going to have to figure out something else. So we have now reached the twilight zone where it's a little bit of light. Some of these animals might have really big eyes. Some of them might not have eyes at all. We're going to explore some of those adaptations a little bit more. But if we dive even farther down, we're going to reach the midnight zone, an area where all of a sudden there's no more of that sunlight reaching this deep. And we're gonna get some really crazy different adaptations from those animals that we're familiar with on land. You might be getting a preview of some of those animals here. But if we were to go a little bit deeper, we would even get to the abyss and then even past that, the trenches where we get the deepest parts of the ocean. Now I'm gonna skip my question of what the deepest part of the ocean is because I assume that's gonna be on your Kahoot, Jesse. Maybe, maybe, Daphne. We'll find out <laughs> together soon. <laughs> All right. Well, I have another question for you. As we go deeper and we lose that sunlight, we're going to also lose that light that comes with it. So how would an animal survive in the deep sea with no light? I personally bring a flashlight. That's just me. <laughs> I'm just saying. I have a submersible with lots of light. But Miss Rickards' class straight to it. Adaptations. What kind of adaptations? Maybe we'll find out together soon. Energy from other animals. So they don't need the light because they're taking in things from other things. Maybe they're eating and bring their own light. Miss Sinclair's on board with my plan. I think there might be quite a few of all these things. You, man, classes today are this is the easiest job I've ever had today. Oh, <laughs> Mr. B's class says trick question. Interesting. Ooh. I like that. I like these are good thoughts. Okay. 
What this well, thing? these these are great ideas, and a lot of these are very true. There's lots of different types of adaptations, right? So one that you might not think of is also just hiding. How do we hide and stay safe in the deep ocean? And we might think of, oh, well, if it's dark, you might want to also be a dark color to help you camouflage and hide. But where there's no light or even in the twilight zone where you only get a little bit of light, we actually don't get any red light. It's the first color to disappear when you go diving in the ocean. You only need to go a couple meters down to lose that red color. So even divers are going to bring flashlights with them to help see those red colors and others as they're exploring the ocean. And you can see an example of an animal that's using that to its advantage. What color is this squid? Red. It's going to be red, which to other animals is going to look black. So great camouflage from this animal. It's one of my favorite adaptations in the deep sea, which is why I've put it in here today. But it's not the only one you'll see here. Some of those other ideas that classes had, such as creating your own light, like this bioluminescent fish, or maybe even a lot of folks' favorite, the anglerfish. Maybe I'll give folks maybe five seconds to share with someone next to them what an anglerfish has to help in the dark. It's not going to be night vision for this fish. It's going to be that it has almost like your flashlight there, Jesse. Yeah. It has a little pocket on a lure that we call it, and it has a plankton or that's going to actually create light, sometimes bacteria that will create light for it. So almost like a little flashlight to help attract food as well as help it see as well. So there's lots of different adaptations, even those big eyes on that chimera there. But I'll give us one look at another anglerfish because I know it's a lot of people's favorites. And you can see another adaptation here being almost completely transparent or see-through. So there's lots of challenges in the deep sea and lots of different ways to overcome them. Jesse, do we have any questions at all? I know I'm quickly going through all of this, but I'd love to see if there are any questions. None so far. No one's put anything in the chat. I think they're all just holding out for the end together, which is, I mean, it's great. And with this freaky fish, I mean, my question, which will be is like, what on earth is this thing? It's the scariest angler fish of all time. Um, but very, very cool. So you can keep going. We'll dive in. We'll keep diving down. Even maybe. All right. <laughs> well, my other question is, there's going to be a lot of pressure in the deep. So if we were to actually send something down to the deep sea, say a human goes down to the deep sea, we are not going to survive. That is too much pressure for us. Imagine swimming down in a swimming pool or in any water source. Your ears are going to start to hurt. Maybe you've had that happen before. That's when all that pressure of that water being on top of you, around you, below you, all of that water pressing in on your eardrums. If we were to send something else down there, uh, yeah, our eardrums are pretty flexible, so they can withstand a bit of that pressure, but not all, not if we go too far and we can't release it. Now, if we were to send something like these fancy cups we have here, these are styrofoam cups, which I know are potentially a polluter, but in this case, we were making sure they were coming back. We had a classroom decorate one styrofoam cup and had it get sent down to the deep. It went over 4,000 meters down. That is super, super deep in the ocean. And when it came back, it was just a small version of what it once was. You can see how much pressure there was on that cup. And then it's from not just on top, it's from all directions. It has that same shape still of that cup. And there are some animals that use this pressure to their advantage, having less of a skeleton, less muscles. They just kind of hang around and let that pressure keep their shape, keep all their body sort of in the right place. 
And that's where you get a lot of those kind of wiggly jiggly animals like that Dumbo octopus at the beginning. But I have a very famous fish right here. Now, this is what it looks like in its natural habitat. I want to see if anyone knows what fish it is. When we take it out of its habitat, it looks very different. So I'll say this, that a class has already referenced this fish in the chat today, but it's like everybody's favorite thing. Miss Sinclair with the win instantly. First thing, our grade two is way to go. Blobfish. Now, cool. you might not recognize the blobfish because it's in its natural habitat. Now, when we take it out of that pressure, think of a water balloon. When we have that water balloon in water, it's going to be its normal balloon shape. But when you hold that water balloon out of water on your hand, it's going to kind of collapse and kind of fall over the edges of your hand. It's going to get all flattened and weird. And that is what happens to the blobfish. It's going to kind of sag like a water balloon. Uh, when it's out of the water. So yes, it did win ugliest animal one year, but I think it's kind of cute. You can let us know in the chat what you think. Do you think it's cute, ugly? What do you think? Pretty cute, I think. That's my call anyway. And you two, maybe they got different things, but it's, it's adorable. <laughs> yeah. Now, yeah, it does look kind of grumpy, doesn't it, uh, Miss Ricard's class? <laughs> but if you are, say, a blobfish, hanging out on the bottom of the deep sea, waiting for food to come by and then quickly grab it out of the water. What kind of food are you looking for? If we're in the deep sea, I know folks were saying there's not a lot of food. What kind of food is there that we're finding? What do we think? What gets there in the deep sea? Mm. Mm. Seaweed, maybe coming down, seaweed growing down there. Interesting. Other fish. So it's just, a, it's fish all the way down. They're just eating each other constantly. Shrimp, they eat each other. Okay, so essence on, like, it's, it's a very predatory environment. Because we're, we're eating each other all the time. There you go. It's like KFC. It, you know what? It is kind of like that. Because we aren't going to get that sunlight getting all the way down to the deep, unfortunately, there's not going to be a lot of uh, kelp and algae growing there that are usually going to use photosynthesis to use the sun for energy. So there might be some, uh, uh, there's gonna be some other bacteria and things growing to kind of support the base of the food chain, but we are gonna get a lot of predators and predation of animals on each other. There's one other food source though, that's gonna help support the bottom of the food chain. And it's gonna help support some of my favorite creatures, uh, which are gonna eat a lot of the kind of extra things and they're going to help recycle nutrients in their ecosystem sort of like earthworms would so these are going to be our sort of decomposers of sorts and they're going to eat a lot of this stuff so it might look like it's snowing but it's actually a bunch of what we call marine snow and this is lots of food and waste and even poop floating down from the at the top of the ocean and it's going to become food for lots of animals like sea cucumbers and maybe some crabs lots of other creatures looking for some food if they're not eating someone else and that's going to be a really important food source that falls down to the deep from the sunlight zone like we're more familiar with. But there's one other source of food that's gonna fall down from the top of the ocean, and that is other animals. So if you don't want to see this, that is okay. You can close your eyes. But I wanna show you something called a whale fall. And I've got a cool video here of a big buffet on a whale that has fallen from the sunlight zone after it has passed away and it is now food supporting so many animals. Let's take a look. I'll pause right here for a second. I'd love to know in the chat, 
how many different types of animals you think you're seeing. Yes, that'd be an extraordinary thing. If you want to type in the chat, please do. But this is just wonderful. We got three, I am, two, five. Yeah. Yeah, there's some great guesses in there. Uh, we're seeing lots of kind of an octopus here. We're seeing some fish for sure. Uh, there's also one that we I uh, see also shark suggested. Maybe some eels. Those kind of elongated fish. We're also yeah. seeing a bunch of one of my favorite ocean animals, worms. There's, we'll, I'll go to the next video in a second, we'll get a better look, but these are a whole bunch of worms that are actually uh, getting nutrients from the area as well, eating a lot of, especially the kind of extra fat and stuff that's around. Yeah, there's something on that truck. Yeah, it might be some of those worms. Yeah, the bacteria mounts. Yeah. And here's the bonanza. Yeah. Oh, this is great. Just think the amount of calories in the whale here. I mean, they're equivalent of so much reed snow. It's hard to even compare. Oh, look at the blubber on the right side. Yeah. So I think this is a really cool example of kind of utilizing what's around you, right? A lot of the animals in the deep sea are scavengers like crows and raccoons and other animals that kind of look for whatever there is nearby. And a, a whale that has passed away and fallen to the bottom, a great source of food for a big feast for so many animals. All right, but my friends, I have, uh, we'll see if we have time for this to make our own creature. I'll have a thing for you in a bit, but my question to you is, how do humans impact the deep sea? What do you think? How would we humans impact the deep sea, even though we might be kilometers or miles away from it? Yeah, I see things like pollution, global warming, definitely. There's a lot of different ways that we can uh, impact it. Hunting, yeah, or fishing. Overfishing, yeah, Miss Hill's class, definitely. So two of the really big ones, um, oh, especially plastic pollution and overfishing. Yeah, those are the two big ones that I was gonna focus on today. There's many ways that we can impact the deep sea and there's many ways that we can help the deep sea as well. So two of those big challenges are overfishing when we take too many animals uh, and that there's not enough to keep the population going. And in the deep sea, a lot of these animals are slow growing. So they might have babies later in their life. And that can mean if we take too many, then it's hard for them to have enough babies fast enough. Um, and plastic pollution too. We're finding plastic in all areas of the ocean, of the ocean, even the deep sea and the deepest parts of it. You can even see sometimes Fish are caught as bycatch accidentally. These are some deep sea creatures that were caught off the coast of British Columbia accidentally. So they were called bycatch. And uh, we've seen, we've got a type of angler fish over here. We've got one of my favorites, a type of snail fish, one of the deepest living fish species and some others. Now, Jesse, if you wanted to be able to make a positive impact on the deep sea uh, with all this pollution and overfishing. Do you know what you could do to make a difference? I could do lots of stuff. I mean, I know that the OceanWise Education website has like the best bunch of solutions in the world ever. So I'm going to make sure all our students get that link at the end of the broadcast too, because there's so much to find. I would make sure that I pack litterless lunches. I would choose sustainable seafood like our picture is here and make sure that wherever I go, I'm picking fish that have been harvested in a sustainable way. Maybe it's indicated by some symbol there, Daphne. Would you tell us a little more about that? Oh, I love it, Jesse. Yes. So one of the ways that I think is really easy is if you're out at a grocery store with your family or if you're at a restaurant, uh, you can actually look for these this OceanWise recommended uh, label. And this means that OceanWise has recommended this seafood item as a more sustainable option. Is it the perfect option? No, nothing's a perfect option, but it's a better option than some of the other seafood uh, items around you. And that just means 
we've done homework for you and you can feel better about that choice over something else. Now, if you have the privilege of not eating seafood at all, that's also great, but some of us might need to eat seafood as well still. So there's so much that we can uh, learn from all of this. There's so many actions we can make a difference with. I'd like to say thank you all so much, and I hope that you all have some fun questions for me today. Ooh. I know we've got that uh, kahoot to get to too. So on, on a couple of notes, I'm gonna leave this slide up for a second while we're pulling up the kahoot. If you guys wanna do our game pin, which is 5713924, we'd love you to take part in that in just a minute. Daphne, before we dive in with that, you had a build your own creature creator. Is this something that people can find on the education website that you could send to me, or is this a special thing that classes can only do in a certain way? What's the deal? So right now it is only within our programs, right. but uh, we are hoping eventually that we can make it accessible to everyone on the website. What I, what I do encourage though, is if teachers do have extra time after the program to right. actually have students pull out paper and maybe some uh, pencils and actually try and design your own deep sea creature. Thinking of some of those adaptations uh, that we talked about earlier, maybe some questions like how is it gonna get uh, eat? How is it going to catch its food? Uh, yep. How is it going to survive with no light? Uh, and all that pressure. So that can help you maybe create your own creature or maybe what you might want to look like as a deep sea creature. Ooh, don't tempt me. Um, <laughs> we're we're, we're going to dive in with this kahoot, which by the way, the presentation perfectly set us up for today, folks. So you don't win anything, but you do win Daphne Nye's everlasting respect. We are going to get underway. The faster you answer, the more points you get. So let's dive in and then we're going to go to all our classes for some questions when this is done. And I'll show you my favorite deep sea creature too, because Daphne did not show it today and I really want you to see it. So we're going to dive in with questions first though. Marine snow. We spend a bit of time on this. Is ice melting on the surface, shower of organic matter slowly sinking, or eggs from coral reef spawning events? 18 answers so far. Half of you are in. Nice, nice, nice. What do we think? Some of our classes have all their own devices. You'll have to let us know who you are, too, if you end up winning the Kahoot today. We'd love to hear from you, but over 55 answers. And most of you got this right. Now, I will note for those of you interested in the coral reef thing, that coral reef spawning is my favorite thing in the entire natural world. So I really encourage you to look up coral reefs laying eggs, because it'll blow your mind when you're done this as a nice follow-up. Okay, Wing Dybex has our lead right now. Let's go to question two together. Daphne, I'm gonna let you give us a little help with this one maybe. The biggest predator of the deep ocean is, this is actually featured as a silhouette on one of your slides. Is it Megalodon it lives? The sperm whale, the giant squid, or the giant isopod? Hmm, I may have been misleading with the picture. I'm trying to throw you off a little. It is a good picture though, I do like it. It is. It is. All right, ooh, a lot of people thought Megalodon lived. A lot of people thought giant squid. It is the sperm whale. It's actually the biggest apex predator ever. Like it was bigger than any dinosaur deep sea thing by weight that used to hunt things. So it's a pretty incredible creature. Although I will bring myself up for a second. If you're keen on Megalodon, I do have a Megalodon tooth and they are so, so cool. It's one of my favorite things I've ever owned. And so if you get the chance to hold one of these and play with it once, they're, they're very fun. But Let's see how that affects our leaderboard, and we will head to question three. This is going to change it a lot. A lot of you thought Megalodon and Squid. Winged Ibex, though, got it, and it's Woo. still in the lead. Okay, question three. Giant isopods, which I do have a picture of. This is not a misleading picture. That is a giant isopod. Is a relative of what? Centipedes, sow bugs or wood lice, spiders, or nothing good? They're just an, an unholy monster from the depths. Hmm. I, I will say this is one of my favorite creatures in the deep sea. I a have a special place in my heart. It does. A lot of people that we have on that are deep sea people love these guys. They're so unique. And so sow bugs, wood lice are our answer. Centipedes are too many legs. But if you look at them from different angles, they look like a really big version of the roly poly bugs in your garden. So uh, nice job to our 24 that got that. The leaderboard has changed. Mighty Lemming takes the lead for winged eyebacks with one more question to go. Now, this is literally this exact question. The deep ocean is the world's largest ecosystem. True or false? Oh, this is, great, as as ever. <laughs> this is a great review question. It is. We didn't plan this. This just uh, is by a fluke. I like it. Over 60 participants now. This is awesome. Right on, everybody. Three, two, one. 
sold to the class with the best answer. Most of you got this right. It is the biggest ecosystem by far on this planet, which is why we always discover new species every time we go looking. Now, Mighty Lemon came in third. Let us know who you are in the chat, stream yard or otherwise. Bright Wolf second. Did our Ibex friend come back to win? We'll find out in three, two, one. Winged Ibex! Like, like... Wire to wire near victory. That is, that's pretty awesome. So way to go. Thank you so much for participating. And we're going to dive in with questions. Daphne, I think you can see us perfectly fine, even though your screen's still up. So that's great. Um, I'm going to head to Mr. B's class first. They're joining us today in Benicia, California. Uh, Matthew Turner School, grade three. If you have a question to kick us off, you're good to go. Hey. How many colors can a jellyfish be? Ooh, that's a great question. And I would say uh, we see pretty much, I would say almost every color in different species of jellyfish. But I would say an individual jellyfish, uh, they're not going to usually be too many colors at once. Usually they're one or two, uh, maybe like a range of colors, say, uh, like a fried egg jellyfish is kind of like white and yellow and kind of orange at the same time. Uh, but I will say um, a different animal that kind of seems similar to a jellyfish, the, uh, they're kind of like sea gooseberries and, you know, all these tinafores, these kind of jelly-like animals. They actually don't uh, bioluminesce. They, uh, they reflect light on their paddles that they have and they look like they're giving off rainbows. Yeah. So another cool animal that lives in the ocean. To I'm pulling this up like as we speak so people can see a picture of this because they are really quite unique. And they're what a lot of people think of when they think of these like multicolored creatures. Uh, so I'll bring this up and then I'll share my favorite creature right after that. And then we're going to go to Miss Hill's class. But our tinafores, which again are not jellyfish, they're related. Yeah. They're really unique, but they make these, they have these like little paddles on them on the side that make these rainbow colors. So they're very, very special. Um, so that's one. And then I want to show you, let's see, stop sharing that guy really quick. The barrel eye, the freakiest evolution in the entire deep sea. I uh, yes. knows what I'm talking about before I show it. Uh, they are, they're something special. So they want to look upwards because that's how they hunt. And so basically their entire head has become transparent and their eyes have moved back so that they can constantly look up while swimming flat, which is really, imagine if your whole head became transparent so that your eyes could just look up at the sky above you. That's just uh, freaky stuff. Uh, and I would say one of my favorite things about the deep sea is that there's so much more to explore and you could never fit all the cool animals into one program. So it just means that there's so much that you can explore on your own or maybe as a class afterwards. I, I think we've inspired them, certainly. Um, Keswick, uh, Miss Hill's class, if you guys want to come on in, you're good to go. Hey, guys. <laughs> Do you know how many fish there are in the ocean? How many? Daphne, start counting. Let's do it together. <laughs> One, two, three. Four. There's a lot of animals in the ocean, fish included. I don't know that we have, uh, I, I'd say it's really hard to get a proper estimate, but it would definitely be, you know, billions of like fish billions. in the ocean. Yeah, uh, uncountable uh, number of fish. Um, I like to think of it this way. What was the line? It's just in terms of the ocean, scale of the oceans. There's more drops of what, like, I mean, there's, there's, an, I don't I'm trying to come up with weird analogies here. I'm going to stop while I'm behind. Um, Madam Stephanie Milton, if you guys want to come in and stop me and save me for myself, uh, you're welcome to turn on your mic and uh, camera in a second. While we're doing that, while I'm waiting for you, uh, Miss Kelly's class is asking a bunch of great questions, uh, including are anglerfish born with their, their light or their lure at the top of them? And I'm looking this up. Here we go. That's a great question. I don't actually know the answer to that one, but... I would say that as a young baby, they may not have it already. A lot of fish are going to look very similar to, to their adult form when they're born, but they still have a bit of growing to do for some of those uh, parts of their body. But I don't know, maybe they are born with it. They do not. I just looked this up. So they're born without it. Um, but I do encourage our classes in anglerfish follow-up. Male anglerfish versus female anglerfish. Daphne knows where I'm going with this. So every anglerfish you've ever seen is a girl because the boys are way tinier. And all they do is swim up and bite onto her and then get like absorbed into her body, which is a really freaky, freaky weird thing. Daphne, what are you pulling uh, up? Do you have a male in this? Do you have a male in this picture? So I didn't, I was worried about time, so I didn't mention it before, but we actually have two males and a female in this photo. You'll see we actually have a uh, little male right here and a little male right there that because in the deep sea, it's really hard to find 
a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a partner, uh, they actually are going to fight her and actually attach to her so that they're together forever. So maybe it's creepy, maybe it's romantic. <laughs> Depends on the eye of the beholder. I love it. I didn't notice that when you showed it earlier. I thought they were weird fins. Uh, we are coming to our other classes. I promise stick around five more minutes, folks. One more question per class. Madam Stephanie's class, unmute your mic. You're good to go, guys. Welcome in. Hey. Oh, wants to work. Hi, are. thanks so much for the presentation. Um, what is uh, what is the most um, endangered species in the ocean? Ooh. Oh, you know, I would say it's really hard to pick one. Unfortunately, there are many, many different endangered species and across all different types of animals. Um, I would say one that I like to kind of talk about is one that we don't think about. But in general, as a group or sort of type or category of animal, a lot of sea cucumbers, which are one of my favorite animals in the ocean, uh, are actually endangered and overfished. So an animal that you might not think much about, but is very important as a kind of recycler in their ecosystem, one that's really big, uh, has big threats happening, but there are so many animals from dolphins to fish to sharks are another big one that have lots of species that are um, at risk as well. Yep. I, uh, I, this is kind of gross, but we already showed a whale fall and other gross things. Sea cucumbers when they're attacked will throw up their entire stomach, like their entire, like bleh, their guts at the thing and then sort of go away, which is really freaky. And then they regrow them. Imagine if you could regrow your organs. That's what sea cucumbers can do. So they're a really special, weird creature. And I'm glad every time I'm Daphne brings them up. I uh, mean, my, my favorite fact about them is that they actually breathe not through their mouth, but through their anus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They are a bum breather. It's every favorite thing. Um, Miss Rickard's class, Tucson, we're going to come to you and then Miss Sinclair will wrap up in Galspell after that. Uh, but come on in, fifth graders, unmute, come chat with us. Hello, yes, you, don't be shy, no need to hide. <laughs> you got to unmute though, because otherwise we just see you, but they don't hear you. That's no fun. Hey. Um, what is the deepest a person has ever been? Ooh. Oh, ah, I can't remember the depth off the top of my head, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Jesse, but actually the director of movies, yep. James Cameron from like Titanic and Avatar uh, mm -hmm. has, he's been very well and has been able to help support a lot of deep sea exploration and has been able to go down. Is he still the deepest? No, well, so they, they all go to the same spot. So the Mariana right. Trench is the deepest spot in the ocean. It is the place that's deeper than Mount Everest. And there were two guys that went in, I think, the early 60s together in like a big metal sphere. And no one had been in decades until James Cameron, who directed Avatar, went down recently. And a few other people have gone since then in really, really high-tech submersibles. So I think we're at like six or seven people now that have been to the deepest point of the ocean. But what I like comparing this to, more people have been on the moon than have been to the deepest point of the ocean. So it's a really inhospitable, difficult environment to get to. Uh, and it, it's incredible that there's been so few people down to the deepest depths of the ocean. Great question. Man. All right, time flies and you're having fun, folks. Um, I'm going to make sure that you have the resources to keep the learning going when you're done this. I'm going to link you to OceanWise's stuff, some deep sea resources that are just awesome. Uh, but Miss Sinclair's class, if you want to wrap us up with one live, last live question, you are good to go. Hey. How many types of animals are there in the deep sea? Ooh, lots I, of water. <laughs> I love this question because you know what? Pretty much every time that people go down exploring the uh, the deep sea, they discover new animals. So we actually don't know how many different types of animals are down there, but it does mean that if you want to be one of those people to discover a new animal in the deep sea, you could do that when you're older. So if you think the ocean's cool, there are lots of jobs around the deep sea, especially if you like, even if you like uh, video games, if you like math, if you like art, if you like teaching others, if you like learning more about the ocean, there's lots of jobs that relate to the ocean uh, and the deep sea as well. I'm going to share something on the screen just from uh, Mr. B's class because it's so, so nice. So Mr. B's joined us for a lot of programs and this is that's pretty high praise. So thank you guys in Venetia. That's really, really nice of you to say. Um, I will note, again, I'm going to share all these amazing clips, and we've had, um, on the deep sea new species note, we've had some people that go down in the submersibles to the deep ocean all the time, 
And I got a student asked, how many species have you discovered to this amazing scientist? And she said, I actually don't remember. Like there's so many new things that have never been found that she's found herself that she can't even keep track of them all anymore. Every time we go, we discover new things. It's what makes the deep sea so, so exciting. And what makes this program so exciting, Daphne, such a pleasure as always. Thank you so much for all of this. Um, we're going to link into OceanWise's stuff. Stay tuned for that email, everyone. Daphne, as you know well, I think we're going to get a pretty enthusiastic audience today for this. Uh, Mr. B, Miss Hill, Madam Stephanie, Miss Rickard, Miss Sinclair, unmute your mics and come join me in saying a big thank you. And for all. <laughs>